Okay, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, the topic of my presentations uh, is rather rarely on, on that academy. Uh, why aviation? Because I love aviation since I was very young. Uh, I've always dreamed to be a commercial pilot, and I completed almost whole training for an airline pilot, but finally I became the university teacher. Why? Well, university teacher in Poland is much, much <laughs> less than airline pilot. But during some day, uh, during some day, I realized that I prefer to do something creative. Uh, that's something what is mainly well paid. Uh, of course, being an airline pilot is a very interesting job and well paid. But uh, with all respect to pilots, now it's not a creative job. Uh, because now pilot must only execute an orders. There is no field for, let's say, thinking too much. Uh, but I will show you uh, in a few minutes uh, times where flying was very creative, um, with fantasy, with a lot of art, but also very dangerous. Well, present aviation is very safe, is the safest uh, mean of transport, but, uh, well, it is creative for scientists, it is creative for, for designers, but not for pilots. Pilots must only execute and orders, uh, and that's all. Uh, how can I change the slide? Oh my God. Uh, yes, and uh, well, first I will go to deep, deep history since medieval age. Uh, during um, many, many years, uh, the methods of let's say, design of the soldiers have changed. Uh, into Middle Ages, the rich knights uh, didn't want to hide them, but they wanted to show how rich they are, how dangerous they are, how well trained, and they had extremely uh, expensive uh, armors, ornament, and so on, and they wanted to show uh, I'm very rich, I'm very strong. If you want to survive, better escape. Or if you feel as strong as I, you can try to, to fight with me. Uh, their armor could be very, very expensive. For example, a single sword or a single helmet could cost more than a village. Uh, later, it, ch it changed during the, the years. Uh, when armies started to have the uniforms which became rather camouflaged, so they were rather to hide a soldier, not to show. But some elements of the, some colorful elements were still visible at the beginning of 20th century. And at the, uh, on the bottom of the slide, you can see the French infantry soldiers from 1940 who still had red trousers and hats. And it caused a huge losses during the first stages of World War I because soldier in red trousers was an easy target and could be seen and hit from big distance when German soldiers had gray and green uniforms. Uh, and they later changed it because they realized that uh, soldier rather should be hidden than shown. And nowadays, uh, we have completely camouflages. You can see a photo on the, uh, on the up uh, screen uh, with a present uh, special forces soldiers who, who, which is completely un invisible um, in the environment. Uh, okay. Uh, first airplanes at the beginning of the aviation period uh, usually weren't painted. They just flew into original materials which were made mainly uh, wooden, uh, wood and uh, covered by fabric, sometimes some metal sheets. Uh, more or less it was something like, uh, like quasi camouflage, but uh, during uh, World War I, uh, airplanes started to be painted uh, because they realized that 
uh, airplane, which is more difficult to see, has a big chance, bigger chance to survive. Uh, and well, uh, during the World War I, uh, they again introduced some rules from Middle Ages because uh, there were some group of pilots who were very rich, who came from royal families. Uh, well, generally at the beginning of aviation, mainly uh, very rich people could fly. And they started to paint their airplanes uh, by completely different manner than official instructions. And it's interesting that uh, the biggest fantasy in art of painting airplanes was in Germany. Uh, it can sound strange because Germans rather uh, are very strict. Yeah, they are, they are uh, usually uh, very. Mm, <laughs> they live uh, due to rules and so on. But in that time, it's interesting that uh, in G Germany, rules of painting aircraft were much uh, flexi more flexible than in than in uh, Western Europe. I, I say Western Europe you know, because in that times. Mm, Germany was not called completely as a Western uh, country. Uh, during the first years of the 20th century, Berlin and Vienna were called as Eastern uh, cities, not Western. Uh, so in that time, UK, France, and so on, these were the completely Western countries. Uh, and in Germany, many uh, pilots uh, have changed painting by themselves, or they hired artists. Uh, to show um, that they are different, better, and so on, so on. And uh, on the left, uh, you can see uh, the, one of the most famo famous fighter airplanes of World War I, uh, Fokker DR-1, into the official um, green painting due to instruction. On the right, you can see the same airplanes painted by artist impressions of some famous pilots, including very well-known uh, red uh, Fokker of the uh, Manfred von Richthofen, Red Baron, who was uh, who came from Świdnica, Świdnica, and he was born in Wrocław, Breslau, and lived in Świdnica. Uh, his uh, his home is still standing, but now it's very bad state. Um, but it's still it, it survives to today. Uh, okay, uh, here you can see other examples of some artistic paintings uh, of some famous pilots. Uh, they used uh, as shapes wo what we could call now as op art. Uh, because also a task of that paintings was to introduce some, um, some illusions in enemy. That if uh, the enemy aircraft see that airplane from some distance, you know, often could, could be not sure what he is seeing. Is it an airplane or a group of birds or something like that? Uh, and this is, these are the airplanes of that famous Red Baron, uh, what I mentioned before. Uh, he had 15 or 20 air, red airplanes. It was not a single airplane. Uh, he had crashed a lot of airplanes, uh, especially that even during an initial uh, pilot training, he crashed an airplane. And he was to be failed, but he was very rich and his family could buy him next lessons, and finally he, he passed an exam, and he became an excellent pilot, but he crashed, I don't remember, five or ten airplanes uh, into his career. Uh, during that time, uh, flying was extremely dangerous. It was extremely dangerous sport. Uh, there were periods during World War I when the uh, average life of a pilot on the front was a week or two weeks only. Uh, not, not so nice here yeah, for, for nowadays. But they were also extremely famous and popular in population. Uh, these pilots were as popular as now the, some ma main sports stars or singers uh, and, and so on. Okay, uh, and art. Uh, well, it can f sound strange that artists did take part in war, that they realized orders from uh, from Kaisers, Germany, and so on. But we must remember that in that times, um, art was often very connected with nationalism. It was not like nowadays. Yeah? Uh, 
connecting of art with pacifism, with anti-war ideology is something modern nowadays. In that days, many artists uh, executed orders of, uh, of governments, including taking part in the war. Uh, even famous Walter Gropius, yes, the first chairman of uh, Bauhaus, uh, was a soldier uh, during World War I, and he was proud of it. He, he has never hidden it. Of course, he was against Hitler later, but he uh, has always said, I am German patriot. I am against Hitler, but I am German patriot, and I am proud that I did fight in World War I. Uh, it was well, completely different times than nowadays. Anyway, uh, during World War I in 1916, if I remember well, uh, the German Air Force hired impressionist uh, artists, especially uh, the pointillists, to design uh, painting uh, patterns uh, for airplanes. As you can see, these were very sophisticated uh, patterns. Uh, usually, that patterns were printed on the fabric, because in um, that times, most of airplanes had a skin of a fabric, and that fabric could be printed. So uh, it was printed on the fabric, fabric was sticked on the uh, on the wings, uh, so that aircraft often had very sophisticated camouflage, let's say, uh, which also made some effect like, like opart. Uh, uh, here you can see the other example of a printed camouflage, the lo lozenge. Uh, you, you just take a, a printed uh, fabric, cut a piece and stick on the airplane. So it was, uh, they, they didn't have to paint that all by own hands, but sometimes they did. Uh, uh, for example, that kind of airplane had a wooden fuselage and uh, wings covered by fabric. So we could paint, uh, sorry, we could uh, put the uh, printed fabric on the wings, but uh, that pattern on the fuselage had to be painted by hand. Uh, and uh, they painted that very sophisticated paintings, Hashem's and so on, so on, uh, for the machines which uh, flew only a few weeks, sometimes only, uh, sometimes only a few days, and that was all. Especially that airplanes in that times you have used much faster. Now, airplane can fly 40 years and it's, it can be still very well. In that times, after a year or two of use, um, uh, airplane had to be scrapped. It was completely wreck. Okay, uh, some inspiration for that patterns could be also the mm, maps, so the photos from, from above. Uh, as usual in art, we have some inspiration. Uh, here you can, you can see also another uh, examples of the uh, lozenge patterns. Uh, in that case, with Polish painting, because mm, uh, in 1918, Poland have captured and bought a lot of German aircraft uh, with their st traditional camouflage. Mm. Uh, later in the 20s, we had famous uh, artist Sonia Denulai uh, who experimented with uh, some strange paintings, let's say. Uh, it was inspiration also from some aircraft painting. Uh, here, the example from Poland. Uh, I will now shortly, shortly, I know I must uh, finish, so shortly, uh, last examples. Here in World War II, uh, there were uh, special bombers painting in an artistic way because their task was to collect, was to, was to be visible in air and collect the bomber groups which flew over Germany. And so they had very uh, artistic paintings often. Uh, the more colorful the, the better it was. And the last example, uh, also painting designed by artists, uh, the Norman Wilkinson, the artist hired by British Royal Navy, which designed a pattern based on zebra, uh, also something like present op art. Uh, and well, I could discuss about it all day, but I had only a few minutes, so I must finish now. And f f thank you, it's all. Thank you very much. Yeah. Five minutes of discussion. Whoever has a question or comment. There is one. I have a question. 
What color are, uh, are now very popular in the Minecraft? Uh, uh, what know? color are now used? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All whole colors. Uh, now, uh, it, it also depends if you ask about military or, or civilian airplanes. In military, I, military, I military are usually grey. Yeah, they are usually grey and dark patterns because they are camouflaged. But it also depends uh, what kind of airplane is, it is. Uh, for example, there are let's say offensive and defensive camouflages. Uh, offensive are rather grey. Uh, because offensive camouflage must high airplane, which is uh, high in the in the air. Defensive uh, have uh, colors from the ground because um, they, they are for airplanes which are flying low, and they must be um, hidden. Let's say when they are seeing from above. But usually, usually uh, camouflage patterns which which are to hide an airplane, not, not to show. Yeah? Uh, there are exceptions, like for example, some aerobatic groups. They are often painted uh, by uh, red, blue, and so on, so on, uh, because their style is to show for, for propaganda rules and so on. But rather, rather dark colors or, or gray. Okay, and I have uh, another question, because I hear that we are painting the, the planes because uh, otherwise we should polish them uh, every year, after every use. Uh, there is, this is true or not? Because uh, no, no, the uh, no. paints also weigh something. So. Uh, well, uh, no, not quite. There are, there are many airplanes where, which are still flying without any painting, which uh, made also some profits, because uh, to paint a pl an airplane which has, let's say, 20 meters, we must use a paint which have 20, 30 kilograms of weight. Uh, so sometimes it's, it's better to, uh, to leave an airplane without any painting. For example, if you see a silver airplane, mm -hmm. silver airplane usually uh, have no paint. It's uh, stayed in the natural color of aluminum. Dural is the main uh, material for present jets. Uh, but, uh, well, there is, a, for example, a technique of painting not by spray and, or not by paint, but by special sticks. Okay. For example, we, we uh, present airplanes of Polish Air Force, uh, which are in the different kinds of, of uh, grey. They are painting by uh, putting a stick on, on them with high temperature. And what's interesting, uh, they are not soft in touch. They are like... Uh, the um, papier <laughs> Yes, uh, I don't know if you've seen, for example, F-16 from the short distance. If you will touch the F-16, uh, it's not soft. It's it's like uh, uh, that screwing paper. Yeah, uh, it's some technology of of uh, sand and uh, small uh, plastic balls. Uh, which also, well, I, I should, to describe it in detail, I should make a lecture about aerodynamics, why sometimes uh, the uh, sharp layer is better than, than soft. Uh, but usually so it's like that, and many airplanes also fly without any painting. Mm. Thank you. It's not necessarily to, uh, to polish it. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Yeah. Uh, just a remark, like I would really like to see what modern military aircrafts would look in invisible spectrum, you know, because nowadays like uh, we don't use eyes or visible spectrum of light to identify objects in the sky, yeah, we rather use radars and so on, so uh, I think this would be a really nice, nice visualization to show what like some Boeing yeah. or any other kind of military air aircraft look in this higher mm -hmm. ener energy radiation spectrum? Uh, there are paintings, uh, the paints, not painting, paints, uh, which can reduce the radar uh, vision. But uh, I think that you are, uh, you are talking about the even next generation, uh, the complete invisibility. Uh, most probably is possible. Uh, we don't have detailed information because it's secret, but most probably there is a technology now which can force an object to be inv invisible uh, to make that um, solar uh, signals 
can um, overflow it. It's, uh, it's similar like, uh, for example, when you have uh, strong light, let's say a sun, and we will see like a finger or, or some stick uh, in front of the light, we often c cannot see it, yeah? because the solar uh, signals can overflow uh, that, that body. And most probably, there is technology which can force signal, uh, solar signals and radar signals, or electromagnetic signals, uh, to overflow a body. Mm, but I don't know uh, uh, details. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Jakub, for your presentation. I'm not a pilot, but uh, I will be talking about also some flights. Uh, um, maybe psycho flights, maybe not real flights, to cosmic, let's say, uh, orders. And uh, Professor, Professor Jezierski showed us uh, really nice uh, uh, stones, nice things. And I was thinking maybe I should show something or I should propose some kind of a uh, common experience or something like that, but probably that would be too much. Uh, that's why only uh, I've got some kind of uh, fr uh, frames and presentation and some words, because uh, everything what I would uh, what uh, I will be talking about is very 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 subjective, and some even people say that is there is no possibility to talk about it because there is no description uh, of this experience. All right, but let's start from the beginning. Um, I will be talking about some uh, simple from the chemical point of view substances. Uh, and um, uh, to, identify, uh, to make some identification of some of them, let's say that uh, we are talking about psilocybin, DMT, uh, uh, mescaline, and LSD. Yes, that, uh, that's four of those, uh, uh, some of them are really well known. Uh, um, four, four of those are really classical, let's say, uh, psychedelic uh, uh, substances. And uh, from point of view, uh, let's say, uh, real life, uh, we call some of them, for example, uh, like this one, uh, magic, um, magical mushrooms and uh, magic mushrooms. And uh, the psychoactive compound of those mushrooms is uh, psilocybin, yes, uh, which is probably well uh, known. All right, uh, and uh, I've got two messages. And uh, uh, one message is to be uh, careful, and especially if you are materialist. Why? Uh, because psychedelics use may causally influence metaphysical beliefs, yes? shifting them away from hard materialism. And this is not only my opinion. Uh, there is a paper published in 2021 uh, in um, Scientific Reports. That is one of the journals uh, in nat uh, of the nature journals. And uh, here we've got some kind of details. First of all, they try to uh, they made a, a metaphysical survey, almost 900 respondents, and also controlled clinical trial, and they measured beliefs before and after uh, attending a ceremony in which psychedelic compound was taken, and uh, for that uh, research they propose kind of a matrix of uh, ontological or metaphysical beliefs. And uh, as an ontologist, uh, I would say that is a simplification, but still we need to have some kind of a, a operational, let's say, matrix. And uh, we've got some uh, here definition. For example, materialism, what does it mean? It's a kind of a belief, metaphysical belief, that there is just one primary reality. The physical, for example, the mind or consciousness is just physical or, let's say, functional properties of the brain and has an anterior material explanation. And then we've got also panpsychism, that mind, consciousness, or soul is a fundamental quality of all things in the universe, either animate or inanimate. Every, everything has kind of a soul. Yes. And um, dualism also, there are two separate realms of existence. Yes, the physical one and the, let's say, uh, uh, they call it, uh, let's say the mind, uh, and the later uh, being non-physical or non-material. All right, what are the results? Why, why the materialists should be careful? Baseline hard materialists tended to shift away from this position after psychedelic use. In fact, such shifts were more common than not. Among those who did shift, 
uh, the nature of the shift was either towards the non-mixed position or hard dualism. Okay, that is interesting. And um, so uh, for those who, uh, uh, who uh, are believing in, uh, let's say, polar metaphysical views, uh, if those views are, were really polar, then uh, after, uh, after uh, the psychedelic experience, they, uh, they were much more, let's say, moderate in, in their uh, beliefs. What is also uh, important, um, th those who uh, held more moderate views on panpsychism, for example, they became more convinced of this position post-psychedelic experience. And it is also uh, interesting that lifetime psychedelic, not only once, but lifetime psychedelic use was positively correlated with panpsychist view. Uh, what, uh, let's say, uh, uh, I would say that is uh, something like a rather natural, let's say, consequence. Okay. Mm. Why I'm talking about and why I'm interested in psychedelic experience uh, is, uh, the, let's say, the, the Metaphysical, uh, metaphysical beliefs are one of the reasons, but the second and maybe more important and maybe the most important is that uh, psychedelics at now, uh, there is a lot of research about psychedelics. Uh, and for example, uh, from uh, January to June of this year, uh, there were published uh, one, more than 1,700 papers in uh, medicine journals uh, uh, and scientific journals which uh, use the word psychedelics. Uh, this is a Google Scholar shield, uh, uh, search and we could see it here. From science 2019, uh, there were published mo more than f uh, 15,000 papers that use the word psychedelics uh, in scientific journals. And uh, from uh, science uh, 2019, uh, there were published more than 5,000 papers about psilocybin, or not about, but uh, papers that were used the word psilocybin cubensis. This is the scientific word for, uh, for, for uh, magic mushrooms. Um, and uh, why uh, this is... Uh, uh, just a second, because this is, <laughs> this is not my, uh, the, the newest version of my presentation. Uh, and... Um, Jakub is... All right. Uh, 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 I've got some mentions of uh, some pre of previous talks in my the, the newest version of my presentation, but still, uh, why uh, why this is important? Uh, because of treatment of mental disor uh, disorders. This is the main reason uh, that the research is uh, carrying on, and uh, uh, there are many differences between. Uh, between regular traditional ways and uh, let's say psychedelic ways and for example in psychedelics we've got single uh, session uh, not a lot of session uh, there is uh, a su super uh, uh, supervision uh, uh, and in traditional rather without supervision uh, and uh, there is rather sang uh, single psychoactive drug but uh, in, uh, in traditional way uh, when we, we've got depression, let's say we are taking pills you know, for one year or two years. And there is a big difference in form, let's say, of treating. And uh, there is a lot of differences, uh, and uh, uh, this experience is not obvious, uh, the, this, ex uh, this uh, psychedelic experience. And for example, I think Elżbieta yesterday, in yesterday's talk, she was talking about not maybe uh, psychedelic experience, but Lots of, let's say, subjective effects are the same. Um, all right. One uh, could comparable to near-death experience, this psychedelic experience. Or uh, unfortunately not. Uh, <laughs> experience of EU, something, of AU, something like uh, Kant, uh, Kant uh, call it uh, the sublime or uh, traumatic events, or alpine uh, excursions, or non-polar ontological shock, I would say, something like that. Uh, all right, but uh, there are also research, there is also research on the, on the personality change after the uh, 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 psychedelic experience. And uh, what I wanted to mention is that psilocybin, for example, decreases neuroticism and increases consciousness, extension, and openness. 
and uh, those are empirical uh, research. Uh, it's not only an opinion or something like that. And uh, that's why we need to be careful. Uh, uh, for example, some of our family members cannot even uh, recognize the same person after, the, uh, after that experience. That's why is that could be dangerous. Um, there are a lot of, uh, 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 let's say, results on that uh, uh, research. Nevertheless, what I wanted to mention is the cognitive restructuring. Uh, uh, because uh, it's not only about vision that I will be talking about in a moment, but it's about some kind of a cognitive, uh, cognitive uh, changes. And uh, let's start with the vision. Uh, uh, there is uh, something like a subjective index uh, effects, and we, uh, we could find out more than 200 effects. Uh, and on the left, we've, uh, here we could see uh, visual effects, and for example, amplifications of color enhancement, magnification, pattern and recognition enhancement, uh, about su uh, suppressions. We've got color depression, double vision, pattern recognition suppression, and lot, lot, uh, lots of others. And distortions is uh, very popular, for example, after images, uh, brightness al uh, alteration, color replacement, color shifting, drifting, like morphing, briefing, lots of re really subjective and individual effects. Uh, and I think that uh, at now we should see some of those effects. And I will use uh, the YouTube video. There are levels of experience. Unfortunately, uh, someone closed my... Yeah, just a moment. Uh, uh, Josie, Josie Keynes, she distinguished uh, she distinguished seven levels of this experience, and uh, ah, you know someone closed my <laughs> YouTube video, and uh, and, uh, and I will show uh, her interpretation of the moderate level. That is the third level, um, and it's nice to see. Ah, uh, yeah. All right. This is the best one. But now we've got some, let's say, image what uh, I'm talking about. Um, and, I'm, and I'm rather interested in some kind of a, um, uh, some kind of a, let's say, philosophical analysis of this experience and consequences. And then I, will, I, I just want to uh, show one picture that uh, uh, when we are thinking what is going on with our consciousness, yes? And it's not easy to say something, uh, uh, let's say, what is not obvious, but still it is possible. And 
uh, Andrew Gallimore, he proposed kind of an interpretation within integrated information theory, what is going on with that uh, experience. That is the paper of uh, Gallimore. And uh, what I want to stress here, uh, on the left we've got a table, uh, let's say, with some uh, theory interpretation, but on the right we've got phenomenological features. And for example, I'm, I'm interested in the uh, changes in the conceptual framework and uh, the relative prominence of concepts in the experience changes. Some concepts became less noticeable. Uh, for example, the, our ego is also uh, less, uh, uh, let's say, less important than in a natural um, uh, state. And uh, whilst other pop out, yes, uh, uh, completely novel concepts may also appear uh, during that kind of an experience. And here we've got, let's say, the uh, Gallimore, uh, Gallimore uh, picture of the consciousness. And, uh, no? okay. and uh, mm, uh, on the left, we've got uh, um, the past. On the right, we've got future. And this uh, red uh, ball is a present, uh, a present state. And uh, we can see that the area of the circular section at each time point represents uh, the number of potential states. But psychedelic drugs uh, increase the number of potential past and future states, uh, expanding somehow the reali uh, reality cones. Somehow it could change our, our subjective uh, way of, let's say, experiencing of our f uh, past also which is not imaginable, let's say, in the real time. Uh, all right. Uh, I, I, within the conceptual changes, we've got uh, something like a conceptual overlap between concepts. Uh, Well-defined and clear concepts became novel, strange, and sometimes bizarre. Uh, uh, some, uh, some boundaries between concepts are dissolved. Uh, and uh, mm, there is a lot of ra uh, other, uh, let's say, results which one uh, could, uh, which one could uh, analyze. What is important is a kind of a de disorganization of the uh, brain and disorganization, a big rest restart of the consciousness also. And uh, my, uh, second, uh, my second message would be the uh, wandering, Magda wandering, uh, uh, psychedelic mind or uh, Socratic hammer that I think that, the, uh, like Hutchins, he said something like that, the maintenance of order and the increase in order are not always good things. Because we are thinking when, for example, I'm doing mathematical philosophy, then I maintain the order. And, uh, but uh, human cognition is uh, a part of a cycle. And somehow we are going, you know, from order to disorder, from order to disorder. And uh, that is the, let's say, the second message. If you want to be uh, dogmatic or we want to stick too much to conceptual structures, uh, that kind of, an, uh, let's say, of experience in even in scientific research are, uh, are important. All right. Thanks a lot for your attention. A lot for this for this lecture, which is also open for discussion. Here is it. I actually have two questions, so maybe we can make them quick. <clears throat> the first question is just in general overall. I imagine there's some resistance <clears throat> to just being able to intellectually, or for some people, to be able to just intellectually even engage with what you're proposing because there's a stigma around psychedelics, around drugs. How do you, in your work, overcome such stigmas? Or what, what do you say? Uh, first of all, uh, I, am <laughs> I am a part of Polish Academy. And I am, uh, um, I am um, uh, before my habilitation shrift, and that, that is very important thing in uh, academy when you want to, uh, when you want to become a professor, you need to be habilitated uh, in our country, and uh, that's why I've got only two present, two paper, two uh, presentations during conferences, 
uh, scientific conferences and nothing more. I didn't publish anything because I'm scared <laughs> about that. Because my reviewers could say that I'm, you know, I'm, a, uh, I don't know, I'm addicted or something like that. There is a big uh, methodology and trauma uh, with psychedelics, and but also on the other hand, uh, uh, there are some research about the usage of uh, uh, psychedelics in the US, but also uh, here, and lots of people are using uh, uh, psychedelics, and uh, that's why it's uh, changing. But still, I think in academia, I'm, 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 I'm afraid of that, you know, that's why uh, I didn't publish any paper. Uh, but because even if I publish a, a paper, and I think that uh, we need to involve philosophers, even uh, I think that like one of English philosophers that within the psychedelic th therapy, uh, there must be of course uh, psychiatric, uh, psychiatrist, uh, psychologist, but there must be also, for example, priest if someone is a religious person, or metaphysician if someone is, you know, uh, 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 taking the, uh, taking the uh, psychedelics because of some metaphysical or existential uh, question. That is, that there is a lot of to do uh, with philosophy and psychedelics, but unfortunately, you know, we need to be, <laughs> we need to be uh, uh, careful. <laughs> well, thank you for your bravery, um, I am aware that it heals a lot of people. Um, I have a colleague that works healing veterans and his work has been recognized by the United States government um, with approval. He's been doing it for years and years, a psychologist. So it takes brave people to push the field forward and overcome such limitations. And also people that are um, using it in structured ways that are for the benefit. So thank you for uh, your bravery in presenting. My other question is about this um, notion of shaping the past and future. Uh, this was really an exciting concept for me. And could you speak a little bit more about, is, do you think that's more of like a, a reframing of the past or shifting perspective or could it actually change the past by being in this state because time is really an illusion and when we're in a different state we tap into different states. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Uh, I think that all of those uh, compounds that you mentioned uh, uh, could, be, uh, could be involved and uh, uh, even on Netflix one can find out a couple of movies about psychedelics and there are uh, patients they are, uh, which are talking about, for example, one of them uh, uh, had a five years or seven years depression, you know, and this depression, any pills uh, doesn't, uh, didn't uh, help uh, for this depression, and uh, uh, psilocybin, if I remember correctly, uh, helped for six months, but not uh, for whole life, but for six months, and, uh, and as far as I remember, his story was something like that, that he didn't uh, didn't remember uh, what was happened during his uh, childhood in the school because something traumatic was uh, uh, was happened and then uh, uh, we've got something something like a, a cognitive and defense mechanism that our memory and not memorying is very active. Uh, some of our informations we uh, we don't want to or not don't want to it's not about want or not want but uh, we actively uh, uh, have uh, actively let's say yeah <laughs> and uh, and uh, that, that could be the case that something what was really the case uh, and we do not remember about that it's unconscious let's say then uh, we came up and we are feeling with that and integrating during that session and session after the uh, session and that uh, that could be also the case and th there are a lot of there is a lot of um, uh, trip re reports and one could see uh, what what came up with that uh, or pop up uh, out with that uh, within that uh, uh, trips um, and everything could happen. <laughs> Very last question. Yeah. Thank you very much for this, am I on? Uh, for this intriguing presentation, particularly with the kind of bridging of fusion between the psychology uh, and philosophy, that's what you So my question will be going exactly in this direction, particularly in the first time, if I, in, the, in the first part of, of, of your presentation. So, would you say um, that there is a link between the changing, f that the kind of the 
the study which, which you presented are having influence of changes in the kind of ontolog on the ontological framework. So kind of, is it ch really like in the example with materialism, is it kind of leading to changes of the yeah, ontology understanding of the people? And further on, is it kind of, for example, does it explain the, <coughs> now the, you, you talk about dualism, is it kind of, does it coincide with development of non-dualism and the kind of tendency, increase of paper and kind of the, this as a philosophy trend at the moment? Um, uh, those re uh, responders, uh, maybe some of them were philosophers, but probably no, uh, um, most of them w wasn't, uh, uh, were, were not philosophers. And uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to say. You know, it's di maybe what I want to uh, mention, you know, in, Timai in Timaios, that was a dialogue of Plato, some philosophers say that uh, that is kind of an interpretation of the uh, part of the dialogue, really classical dialogue in philosophy, that Plato, Plato said that he, uh, he uh, saw his ideas, yes, and Plato, Plato's ideas shape somehow our culture, <laughs> and Western culture especially, and he saw those ideas during the uh, Eleusian Mysterium, and during those Eleusian mysterious, uh, as some researchers, as claim, researchers I'm cl are cl claiming at now, uh, they took, <laughs> uh, we could say today, uh, LSD. You know? uh, and uh, th that would be my, let's say, answer. That uh, that is maybe, that is a con only, uh, let's say, that is kind of an interpretation. I don't want to say that it's a fact. Uh, but that Plato saw his ideas you know, uh, during uh, that, that ceremony, let's say. That's why uh, there is a l there is a big potential, let's say, uh, let's say, in in, in uh, to impact uh, philosophy, and that's why <laughs> that's why uh, politicians were in U.S. especially really interested in that, you know, uh, <laughs> because the uh, the changing uh, of mind are not one directed. It could be that, for example, if someone is really, uh, let's say, right-handed. Uh, or right winded it could be more uh, it could become more radical it's not obvious you know the, the direction of change is not obvious because this experience is not obvious at all uh, uh, that's why <laughs> let's say i don't know if i ask your question but <laughs> I, I answer your question but uh <laughs> all right thanks a lot so continue the discussion in the lunch break thank you very much uh, <laughs>
Robert Smithson rented a piece of Salt Lake in Utah um, where he piled over six tons of, of ground and stones, uh, creating this enormous 500 meters long spiral. Um, unfortunately, creating this piece uh, caused uh, some effects, like inflicted permanent damage um, on the landscape that he worked on. Um, for example, by using bulldozers to, to scrape and cut the, the ground. Um, similar criticism was raised against Christo um, when he wrapped the coastline of Sydney or surrounded 11 islets in uh, Biscuit Bay. And um, what is controversial, controversial in his actions is not only the scale or uh, the damage of the natural habitats, but also um, the amount and waste of the materials that he used, or simply just the justification of this action itself. Um, following this, following this, we have uh, Peace Golden Shelter by Giuseppe Licari. And in this installation is supposed to bring our attention to the importance of, uh, of forests due to climate change. Uh, he covered uh, some piece of, uh, of the forest with the space blankets that were initially invented by uh, NASA scientists to protect the uh, space um, stations from the solar radiation. And um, so he wanted to, 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 pr to show that this, this radiation is also happening here on, here on Earth and is changing our climate and is uh, threatening our, our natural habitats. But after all, isn't this action quite similar to what Christo was doing? Because after all, he, he covered a huge place of a uh, piece of, of land with, uh, with, uh, with some artificial material. But uh, somehow we tend, or viewers tend to ignore it or not see the scale, um, of, like the, the, the negative uh, part of, of this installation, simply because it has some hidden behind, uh, like deeper meaning. Is it ethical then? And with technological development, uh, not only tools of art have changed, but also the questions that, uh, and, and problems that art is raising. Um, for example, many artists cre create now using uh, tools of uh, biotechnology, um, uh, genetical uh, engineering, or um, tissue cultures, uh, etc. And they are trying to, to raise some problems, uh, issues that, uh, that we on everyday life simply don't see in those fields. Um, but the same as men, you remain, remain unbothered by, um, by the moral, um, moral issues that their art is bringing. And good example may serve uh, the Cactus Project made by Laura Sinti, where do the uh, series of uh, molecular, molecular manipulations, the thorns of the cactus were replaced with the human hair. And uh, it's definitely a very interesting, both scientific and artistic project, but it raised uh, um, some question, it became questionable a few years later when, uh, when she decided to free uh, two of the plants by planting them in some desert uh, in Mexico. Artists claim that, uh, that she liberated plants from the galleries, laboratories and stuff, but the question is from, from what actually were they liberated from? Because the thorns have actual meaning for the plant. They, uh, they, pro uh, they protect it from being eaten by animals, by herbivores, which is, you know, plant, like cactus full of water is a juicy, juicy thing to eat on the desert. Also, uh, uh, thorns limit the water transpiration. So, so the cactus, so the plant don't die, doesn't dry out. So isn't it better to call it rather ab abandonment than, uh, than liberation? Mm, different harm on plants may be seen in this um, Hortu Machina, machina B. 
this, this sphere, kinetic sphere, uh, I believe contains uh, 12 uh, modules, garden modules, with native uh, British plants, which all sounds cool, but um, so there, are some, there are some electrodes that are um, monitoring the plant responses to light, um, temperature, water, and something else that I forgot at this moment. Um, and um, by shifting, by moving these models, and, and like this is kinetic piece, so by, by shifting the center of gravity, it allows this sphere to wander around the, the parks or around the streets, but again, what for? <laughs> like setting uh, sanitary life forms in motion, at least to me, seems completely pointless, because in long term, uh, those gardens have no way to survive. Pl plants will simply die because it's unnatural for them to be upside down. They have, it's not unnatural for them to be in motion. It's causing a big stress, releasing lots of hormones, limiting the light and water access. So the plants would be, because the idea was to, to make our cities greener in the places where they are not green, but, but the plants will die eventually anyway. Um, yes. So now imagine that you have seen artwork that you find deeply troubling. Um, it is artistically inspired, but yet uh, deeply morally questionable. Since late 90s, Wim Delvoy um, Treat, uh, is treating uh, the, the skin of pigs as a canvas, as a living canvas. Um, in 2004, he had to move his farm from Europe where it arose some legal and ethical questions and he moved to China. One can only guess what is happening to those animals in China, which is the country famous, uh, well known from not respecting even human life. Um, Pigs are sedated now, before he was just wrapping them like... Uh, <coughs> making them not move, I forgot the word. <laughs> um, they are sedated, shaved, tattooed, and later left for a couple of weeks to heal the wound, and just to become some personalized uh, leather jacket, which anyone can order or um, some of them become, um, are, are being bought by private collectors or are being exposed in the museums. Um, what does it say about us if we are shocked? And what does it say if we aren't? Art should and actually forces us to to look uh, what we avoid in everyday discourse because it's uh, somehow disturbing, uh, it might be anxiety provoking or simply politically incorrect. Um, it can focus on what is forbidden and for example we accept, socially accept the huge scale uh, animal slaughter uh, of animals that are being kept in uh, extreme conditions in order to obtain their meat, skin, uh, fur, um, then art could be actually the only medium through which we can show this social hypocrisy. It can be exposed because, because we can, we usually rationalize art as just art not the something that is that is happening for real, not not reality. However, this is this is why it's necessary and potentially so powerful. But uh, should then our moral judgments affect aesthetic judgments? In his series, New World Transparent Species, um, Japanese artist based in China, uh, Yoritomita. Uh, is using uh, scientific presentation, uh, preservation methods in order to, uh, to create these um, this objects uh, made of once alive animals. The, the procedure is often used by researchers for, 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 for the research purposes, 
but artists show, uh, saw some commercial potential, uh, potential in, uh, in this activity and uh, proceeded to kill even endangered species, which again in China is not a big deal, uh, in order to sell them online as art decor uh, pieces that, that uh, buyers can expose in their houses. But world is not for sale. Maybe, maybe we are willing to finally adopt the world because when we adopt, we are committing ourselves, well, we, we take responsibility to take care of what we adopt, uh, knowing that ultimately it does not belong to us. Uh, in contrary to the, to the previous piece, uh, Stephen Dam um, is just inspired by natural wonders. His glass sculptures, create some balance between uh, fiction and reality. Structures, colors, surfaces uh, create a vari variety of, of forms and of his imagination. Um, it, it's true for me, at least, that uh, his pieces remind somehow museums' exposition of, of some animal species. And Talking about museums, it's hard not to mention the museum of the history of cattle. Even though mm, this is an art installation, not, actual, um, not an actual place, not actual building, um, its narrative is presented from the, from the bigger community, from the perspective of the, of the cow community which creates some unique situation when animals become dangerously human-like. And artists emphasize, speaking on behalf of someone else is always a possessive gesture. We can't and we don't want to claim that we know what this history has been like and how they have experienced it. Yet the boundary between human and animal became blurred. The cows revealed their history with the evolution of the genius uh, two million years ago, but the um, but the museum focuses mostly on last 150 years of common existence, um, revealing exploitation, exploitation of, the, of the animals. Um, as the final example, uh, I'd like to present you not an actual art piece, but uh, some sort of semi-scientific, huge-scale project um, created by, wait for it, <laughs> hippie theater performers. So Biosphere 2 experiment um, is a, it's enormous, it's a huge building that contains replicas of, Earth, of five Earth ecosystems, uh, coral reef, ocean with coral reef, uh, rainfor tropical rainforest, savanna, mangrove wet wetland, and uh, coastal desert. It costs approximately $200 million to, to build it in four years and $1 million a year to operate it. Originally, it included 3.8 thousand species of animals and plants, um, and in 1991, eight self-called researchers uh, sealed themselves inside for two years to study how environments would evolve and if they can sustain human life. Inventors uh, wanted to build similar biospheres on Moon and uh, eventually on Mars. But after the series of controversies, including the death of almost all animals, majority of plants, uh, starvation issues, uh, uh, dangerously, like life-threatening low levels of oxygen, uh, it was dismissed as a failure. It is true that there was only one Biosphere 2, but it's also true that there is only one Biosphere 1, which is Earth. And ignoring artists' wrongdoings gives them legitimacy to continue uh, their unethical practice. So I have just one question for you. Should art be enjoyed as the separate entity from the artist or artist and his piece should be considered always as an integrated one thing? Thank you. Well, thank you for the lecture and for the question. What is your answer? Or maybe another question? <laughs> no, I'd, I'd love to know your answer too. 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm very curious because I don't know the answer, so. <laughs> I am too, it's a question we ask often. Um, also in terms of musicians, like in the United States, we have a famous musician, R. Kelly, who's been brought against very, very serious charges. And it's a lot of emotional controversy because his music has been the center of culture, especially for, for African-American life um, for a long period of time. And then he's found to have abused young children and like terrible things. And so it's a big question of like, can we separate the artist from the art? Yes, yes, I'm right. <laughs> thank you. Um, um, thank you in general for your really important topics that you raised during your presentation. Um, I'm not sure I don't have the answer to your question. I think that probably nowadays, especially with social media, it's nearly impossible at least to separate a famous artist from the artwork. <laughs> if you're not famous, it's okay. <laughs> but <laughs> if you're famous, then it's kind of impossible. And then also, I think you have some responsibility maybe in the way you can, like, you know, what you do. But I think especially important is also where you, how you've shown how the usage of materials, or in this case, nature, is important um, and how maybe this actually um, is different to the to the obvious meaning like it's supposed maybe to to signify something about nature uh, like bring our emphasis to nature or connect us to nature but in reality plants are suffocating under Christos wrapping and um, you know insects die and plants can't do photosynthesis and yeah, all totally. of this kind of thing so I think it's very important that you that you raise these um, issues. Um, I actually, uh, yeah, wanted just to thank you. <laughs> thank you <laughs> to, to to bring up these topics. I mean, also as an artist who works with digital media, I think we have similar questions in terms of sustainability of the technologies that we use, especially when we think about the whole NFT and blockchain. Um, um, that came up, you know, coinciding with the corona also a little bit and the increased usage of, I don't know, Zoom technologies and so on that has, has increased our personal CO2 footprint immensely in the last couple of years through digital technologies. And it's always also for me a big question how to balance um, and how to justify um, the use of, uh, especially also, you know, AI models use a lot of energy also. Yeah, totally. When it's okay to use and when, when it is not to, you know, just to support the cause. Like, I so. mean, in, in nowadays life, we, we cannot also separate ourselves from the technology, right? Because, like, it's, it's everywhere and we cannot pretend that it doesn't exist. But, but yeah, this is also a very important question. When is, where, where is the border? Thank you. Hi, yeah, uh, thanks very much for that uh, talk. I thought it was very interesting and thought-provoking. Um, I think that to, to just wrestle with your question at the end, which came to me as a bit of a curveball, actually, because I saw it as a sort of a talk about the ethics of art making. And in other words, you can have a wonderful work of art, but it's been produced in a manner that we find dis distasteful or unlawful or unethical or, you know, wrong for many reasons. Um, but it's a it's a it's a two pronged question I think because um, separating the art from the artist, you can have a wonderful work of art that's apparently been made in reasonably ethical way that we think is fantastic, but the artist's own life may have been appalling, and that's a question of separating the art from the artist. And there have been many 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 examples throughout history of artists whose yeah, whose on. whose approach to life um, we would we would find appalling or, and, and quite often also unlawful. But the question of the ethics of the actual making the art, which may also be wonderful work of art, that's a related question, but I think it's important to separate the two. Um, having said all of that, I don't have an answer for you, I'm afraid, but thank you anyway. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your insight. Thank you. Uh, 
I would like to apply a hard science, like uh, physics, uh, to music, especially phonographic market. Firstly, I would like to present the map of phonographic markets according to size of national markets, and uh, we can see uh, surprises because, uh, for example, the island is bigger than Russia, China, or India, according to this map uh, from 2003. So uh, we can see surprises. We can see the biggest markets like the United States, Japan, United Kingdom, or France. On the other hand, we can talk about phonographic market from the, the perspective of uh, artists. Uh, so, uh, because majority of phonographic markets belongs to 30, the 30 most popular artists. So I decided to investigate correlation between albums sales from the most popular artists. For example, you can see that uh, we can present the diagram of uh, record sales of uh, the group Black Eyed Peas. Uh, which was the main star of uh, last year's New Year's Eve in Poland, in Zakopane. Of course, uh, all the other artists could uh, have the same diagrams like this. The most important thing that we can see the peaks of popularity, usually at the moment of the record releases or premieres. So I decided to investigate correlations between record sales of these artists and I could replace correlations by distance between artists and I could detect a minimum spanning tree obtained for the 30 most popular artists. What is important here? In this minimum spanning tree we can detect uh, genres and subgenres uh, for example, we can see sectors uh, for country music like Taylor Swift or Miley Cyrus uh, that played uh, country music. Uh, it was uh, on, in that period, I mean 2003, 2011. On the other hand, we can see sectors for uh, rock music like Coldplay, Nickelback, Green Day, Kings of Leon, and uh, so on. We can see uh, also, uh, hip hop music or R&B. However, if I want to detect a sector for pop music, it was impossible because uh, there is exceptions. We don't see anything for pop music. On the other hand, we can see also sector for stardom because uh, we can see artists like. Jay Z, The Beatles, Michael Jackson, U2, because they belong to completely different genres, but they are all in one uh, sector here in this minimum spanning tree. What is the conclusion for this? I wonder uh, how pop music looked 50 years ago and in 21st century. We can see total differences between pop music from 20th century and 21st century. This is the one answer. And the other one conclusion is that uh, if you want to be popular, you don't have to polish your sound. You don't have to uh, transmit, uh, transfer yourself uh, to the audience. If you want to be successful, just be yourself. This is my conclusion from this minimum spanning tree obtained for the 30 most popular artists. I think that innovators are the winners. Imitators are the losers, according to this. OK, and uh, the other answer that I wanted to give uh, for this uh, phenomena of stardom in this minimum spanning tree, stardom sector, is to analyze seasonal record sales. And uh, I created stochastic model for this. And uh, 
I think that this stochastic model could work according to all the data for markets, uh, but uh, only in Japan. This seasonality could be visible, but in other markets like the United States, France, the UK or Germany, it doesn't work. And according to this, uh, I detected that uh, the reason for this phenomena is that uh, we have additional group of customers before Christmas Eve. That was the answer. And then this model was successful if I added this condition to this model. So let's go further because all the record sales uh, could uh, be determined by product life cycles. And uh, I could also investigate markets, uh, not only from albums perspective, but also uh, I could uh, make research for singles, I mean songs, because uh, usually there are people who want to listen songs, not artists. So I decided to compare product life cycles and introduce time delays between popularity peaks. For example, uh, in case of Rihanna, we can see that firstly Rihanna uh, with Calvin Harris with the song We Found Love was popular in Belgium, in France, later in the United Kingdom, in the Netherlands, and so on. And the last country was Spain. After eight year, weeks, this song reached uh, the peak of popularity in Spain. So if I analyze the peaks of popularity of uh, the most popular songs, I could create uh, the map of Europe, which uh, could show us uh, which country could affect the other one. And uh, usually, the innovators in this product life cycle are uh, the United Kingdom and Ireland, and uh, transmitters are the Netherlands, I mean Benelux, like uh, Belgium or the Netherlands, and the laggards in this product life cycle could be Spain or Austria or Italy. And like Jakub Maszałkiewicz says, Germany and Istria belonged to the East in this map as well. So we could also compare uh, distances between peaks of popularity in different eras. For example, we could uh, see analog eras from the 60s, uh, digital era from the end of 20th century, and uh, internet era from 21st century. So I could explain that uh, distances between peaks of popularity, uh, distances uh, comes from cultural uh, distances, that's the main reason. Okay, we can also think about the scale. Within, within one country, the United Kingdom, we can observe the same phenomena, that there are uh, sub-regions uh, like uh, Scotland, like Midlands, uh, and so on, and London, and we can uh, see the same uh, phenomena, uh, because uh, one region could uh, infect the other one. So, after all, I could, uh, according to empirical data, I can create a map of Europe and I can detect clusters. For example, uh, we can see a German cluster with Switzerland and Austria, according to this singles record sales, Benelux, uh, the United Kingdom and the islands, and Scandinavian sector as well, in the north. But on the other hand, we could uh, see countries that don't belong to any clusters like Italy, France, or Spain. Spain is usually as a laggard. But on the other hand, if uh, we have an uh, attractive song that starts uh, its popularity in Latin countries like Spain, I can mention Despacito. In this case, Spain is an innovator and the United Kingdom is a laggard. But this could be an exception because most of uh, popular songs belong to English-speaking countries. Okay, here we have a map of Europe with directions of which country could infect the other one. 
And usually the role of France is here uh, curious and interesting because uh, sometimes France could be conservative and sometimes France could be a good transmitter. Uh, I think it could be correlated with uh, the France law that prefers uh, French music in radio stations. Maybe that could be the reason. And uh, we could also have uh, cultural, geographical, and economical distances between countries according to this, but we don't have much time. So at the end, I decided to create agent-based model uh, for popularity spread. So I decided to choose uh, 10 sub-networks, uh, Barabashi Alberts, that was the structure of these uh, sub-networks. And uh, in every market I can uh, detect a uh, node with uh, the most connections, with the biggest connectivity, and I can connect this uh, hubs uh, by super networks uh, because these hubs could be considered as capitals of these national markets. And on the other hand, I can also uh, introduce the probability of infections between capitals, which could be inversely proportional to connectivity and proportional to attractiveness of the song. And uh, of course, uh, this model could work and could be consistent with reality if I divide this subnetwork into clusters. I tried to apply this model without clusters and it didn't work so much. So I think the feature of this uh, subnetwork is very important to explain how popularity spread could uh, be visible. Okay, so uh, if we, within one market, I can see that uh, it is possible to reach popularity when you come from peripheral nodes, but you need to wait long time to infect the, the entire market. If you start popularity uh, at the origin in hubs, I mean capital, it is easier and faster to reach popularity. In case of uh, many markets, it is easier to detect uh, hits when uh, you start uh, from the market that belongs to clusters. If you belong to if, uh, if you belong to market that don't be belong to any clusters from peripheral markets. It is hard to detect uh, popularity. You need to wait more time. You have to have a very attractive song to do this. So uh, this is the last uh, diagram uh, for gaining popularity. Above, you can see that uh, it is easier to gain popularity when you come from capitals, from clusters. And uh, on the other hand, you can also see that it is hard to uh, gain popularity when you go from peripheral markets that don't belong to any clusters, but it is possible when you have very attractive song. So uh, thank you for listening, and you can ask questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and of course, uh, the lecture is open for discussion. I remember... Uh, in the years of our transformation, because I'm old enough that a team of uh, business people came to teach us uh, free market behaviors, and they uh, told us, on a geld, kein Musik. With, without money, no music. <laughs> is that <laughs> along these lines? <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, there is one. Hi, thank you very much for your uh, for your talk. And 
I've been recently um, very curious uh, about statistics. I'm oral historian, so I, I study women artist narratives. And uh, at some point, I've, I've grew my interest uh, into archival data uh, and all the, all the knowledge that comes from, from numbers that I didn't even think about before. And I'm wondering about the data set here, because uh, I understand that you are using like pre-existing data that is kind of huge, uh, well-known, and uh, there is a lot of like instances that you can consider. And I, I had this, um, you know, cr creative thing listening to you that that would be so exciting to actually see the map of, you know, how those influences work in artistic research theory, because we have so many, uh, you know, things going on, so much theory, so many books, so many publications, so many ideas, concepts, how it really works in our field from different angles, from different um, disciplines, from different um, uh, cities uh, around the globe, but probably predominantly Europe, Western Europe, and we had this discussion with Vitautas, right? Why are we still looking to the West? And how about the East and Eastern discourses? How can we tr contribute to that? How can we kind of break through, right? If it's uh, an English dominant um, discourse. So, yeah, I have this fantasy, would that be possible somehow to measure or map all those influences and establish some kind of a model? How can we work, use that knowledge for the benefit of our community? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. I think it is uh, possible. Uh, firstly, I would uh, tell you something about data because uh, we have a very good quality of data of 21st century because I can detect uh, weekly record sales uh, with uh, uncertainty, which is equal to 100 copies, which is better than uh, data from stock markets. So that's why uh, I am so proud uh, for uh, detecting all uh, the connections between artists, all the correlations, and how music genres could be detected only from the data. Uh, another uh, question from you is about uh, influences between artists, so I can uh, give you also an uh, answer about uh, negative correlations because uh, there is a special phenomena, uh, because if you are interested in uh, women in music, uh, there were phenomena because, for example, when Amy Winehouse uh, passed away in 2009, uh, her music was negatively correlated with the other artists. On the other hand, Michael Jackson did the same thing. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, quite uh, unusual phenomena in this market, which could be not visible in other markets, like stock markets or commodity markets. It could uh, be similar to fluid mechanics, in my opinion, and I have data for this. And uh, good uh, message is that it is possible uh, to start from peripheral markets at the origin, even from the deep east, if you have a very attractive piece of music. It is possible, according to my research, according to hard data. So don't worry, even if you are far away, it is possible to be popular. Very optimistic. Thank you very much.